Today's talk is by Dr. Monica Ramirez Andriata, and the title is Cultivating Science, Justice, and Action Through Participatory Research Methods. Before I begin, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge that the University of Arizona is on the land and territories of indigenous peoples. Today, Arizona is home to 22 federally recognized tribes, with Tucson being the home of the Odom and the Yaqui. Committed to diversity and inclusion, the university strives to build sustainable relationships with sovereign native nations and indigenous communities through education offerings, partnership, uh, and community service. So today's lecture will last until about 12.45 or so. I'll leave uh, 10 to 15 minutes at the end. Please indicate if you have a question um, for the speaker in the chat box so you can raise your Zoom hand and I'll call on you. And please keep your audio muted uh, during the lecture. So Monica Ramirez Andriotti is an Associate Professor of Environmental Science at the University of Arizona with a joint appointment in the Zuckerman College of Public Health. Using an environmental justice framework and participatory research methods, she investigates exposure pathways and communication strategies to translate environmental health research to action and to achieve structural change. Dr. Ramirez Andriotta's research interests include environmental justice, environmental and community public health, citizen science, risk assessment, and environmental literacy and communication. And with that, I would like to welcome um, yeah, our lecture series today. And we appreciate you taking time out to come to the College of Architecture Planning and Landscape Architecture um, to talk with us. So let me um, stop sharing. Let's see what happened to my stop share button. There we go. I think you should be able to share now. Yes, I can. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you all so very much. Uh, today we will uh, get started. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Gina, for the land acknowledgement. Uh, I would just add uh, that we're also a Hispanic serving institution. Um, which is outstanding. And recently we received the seal of excelencia for our engagement with Hispanic students. To begin this talk, I'm just gonna show a video on one of the projects that I lead with um, a great team of people. And so with that, I will uh, start with this project ensuring you can, so let's uh, make sure. Personally and professionally, my goal is to democratize science. Science is for all, and we're all scientists in our own way. If we look at what causes environmental injustice, they're tied to income, minority status, technical awareness and understanding. And so you can address injustices through the democratization of science. Project Harvest is a citizen science project the motivation of all of us is what is the quality of harvested rainwater? Are there pollutants in harvested rainwater? If so, do they get traps in soils? Could they accumulate in plants? And could those pollutants affect our health? But the other it's critical to work with the communities that live near those sources because they're making daily observations. Project Harvest is operating within four different communities throughout the state of Arizona, neighboring active or legacy mining or research extraction sites. We know that these community members are collecting harvested rainwater in areas neighboring sources of waste. Buenos dias, Mr. Jimenez. How are you? Long time no see. I know. It's great to see you, Fred. Oh, good. Good to see you. The more that we work together in the scientific investigations, the more that paid professional researchers as well as community members will learn. This is great. You have it labeled. Right. Here's my rain barrel. I have it here. And they're intrinsically motivated to learn more about their environment, not only to protect their own health, their family's health. And they're just, this is just one plant but perhaps they want to make changes to how pollution is managed. When working with communities that neighbor waste, you could imagine them being labeled as like a contaminated community. On the flip side, there's so much that they have in terms of their own resiliency. It's not to point fingers, but it's to find the truth and to produce solutions for people. 
it really offered me the way to answer to my inmost concerns. I mean, did I really do well while raising my kids here? Is there going to be any health uh, issues for us or for them because we chose this community to work in? When we moved here, we knew that there were mines here. I think it's very important that I will get the results of the soils in my backyard. We've got around 1,100 samples. We just are starting to digest and work through the year one data sets. The last year of the project will be used to understand this massive data set that we've collected together. If we were to democratize the scientific method, all of us have access to the information to be better informed. Citizen science in general is exciting, and I think it's a paradigm shift in how science and information is being generated. Right. So that uh, I'm very grateful and honored that I was uh, selected for a Landmark Stories video. And I think hi is a nice synopsis of uh, Project Harvest, which is a co-created citizen science, or uh, also currently, but I'll get more into the nomenclature, but could also be considered a community, a community science project. So the goal of the lab, my lab, the students that join this lab are currently here, is to achieve environmental health and climate justice for all. So if you think about it and you count when you started to go to school, right? And so in my case, right, if you, I count kindergarten, that gives us to about, you know, about 20 years in school. And the motivation to keep going to school is to achieve something um, and really thinking about how to make a structural change. And so to begin, I'd like to acknowledge and have a positionality statement. Um, I'm a second generation Mexican-American Chicana who grew up in Tucson, Arizona. I'm actually a Badger, right? I went to Tucson High for high school. Um, my Nana, these are my great aunts. My Nana, my grandmother is in the upper right corner, Margarita, who would tell the story of holding my dad in to cross into the United States so that my dad and other and future generations had more opportunity. I think growing up in a border region right under the La Paz agreement to protect and serve the border 100 kilometers into Mexico and the United States and to protect the Sonoran Chihuahua Desert, which is a top 100 ecosystem in the world, it um, lends you a different perspective as you bear witness to social and environmental degradation in this space. But as highlighted in the video, there's also resiliencies, and these are where it's critical to be working alongside and with community members. Uh, I want to also acknowledge, right, that my dad is an engineer, a former miner, and also had an international medical equipment company, and all four of us had to work for my dad. And the goal was to address health disparities in Mexico and the border region. And so I've been taught and I am here to serve. So when we think about pollution, we know that pollution is the leading global cause of premature death and disease. So what does this mean? I know this is a little bit of a busy infographic, so I would strongly recommend looking at the Global Alliance on Health and Pollution and the publication uh, that was produced in The Lancet by uh, Landrian et al. in 2016, I believe. But that in 2015, disease caused by pollution was responsible for 9 million premature deaths. That's 16% of all global deaths and exposure to contaminated air, water, and soil kills more people than a high sodium diet, obesity, alcohol, road accidents, or child and maternal malnutrition. Three times as many deaths as AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria combined. And so I highlight this because we have a large challenge ahead of us and pollution is disproportionately killing the poor and the vulnerable. If we bring this a little closer to home, this is a map of federally designated cleanup sites. And you can see here in this map, uh, the number of just, again, this is just federally designated sites. But what this has shown, what we know now is that your zip code can be more important than your genetic code, meaning that where you live can dictate your health outcomes. And ultimately we have bared witness over time, right, to environmental racism. 
and that we are striving for justice. So we know that those who are low income and or minority experience a higher, uh, are disproportionately exposed to waste. They might live closer to hazardous waste sites as well as toxic release inventory sites, resource extraction and industry. And we acknowledge, right, that the environmental justice movement that we, what we strive for, right, this fair access to healthy soils, air, water, and foods, and access to the environmental decision-making process, right, this is on, um, was really came together on the heels of the civil rights movement. So acknowledging that we strive for environmental justice, we should, we should acknowledge, right, that, you know, again, on the heels, the civil rights movement of the 1960s sounded the alarm about the public health dangers for their families, their communities, and themselves. And Robert Bullard, who's considered like a godfather of environmental justice in 1968, wrote, whether by conscious design or intellectual neglect, institutional, excuse me, neglect, communities of color and rural poverty pockets or an economically impoverished Native American uh, reservations face some of the worst environmental devastation in the nation. And so this is just acknowledging, right, the efforts of the civil rights movements, right? We saw that Martha Luther King working with the Memphis sanitation workers um, and the strike that occurred in this area for occupational health and exposures. We also should acknowledge Cesar Chavez's work for shedding light on migrant health and the farm worker experience. And so if you think about this as a, you know, if we look at as a consumer, right, so just doing a quick like a critique, right, and um, you might see something to this effect of you see this pristine set uh, landscape and these beautiful superfoods, right, uh, with these berries. However, right, there's a Caucasian here no actual representation of the extreme environment, right, to, to grow these very berries, right? And when we talk about this extreme environment, this is an example of the level of soil fumigation uh, that occurs to be able to grow strawberries, right, in California. And so you can see that we've created this extreme environment where we've been taught as environmental health scientists or environmental scientists and others that the soils are precious, right? That one tablespoon of soil has a million microorganisms, but here we create this space where everything is destroyed, right? To grow a singular crop. But also you can see that there's housing and people in and around these areas than people that work in this area. And so these tarps don't stay together, right? They might tear and people could be exposed to the different types of pesticides and fugus, uh, soil fumicides that are used uh, to create the landscape to be able to grow a strawberry. And ultimately the individual working in this space, this is an example of what that might look like. And so what does this mean, right? So I'm giving, you know, we have this big challenge ahead of us with climate change, climate justice, climate refugees, environmental racism, striving for justice. And it's very important to acknowledge that within the space of environmental uh, justice, there are critical and fundamental challenges. Those include the limits of epidemiology and public health, technical elitism, as well as not accounting for these intercorrelations, right, among what we can think of as uh, among toxic exposures in these underserved, underrepresented spaces. And ultimately conventional health, uh, health interventions and promotion strategies have failed to mitigate the source of environmental health risk for environmental justice communities because the strategies are addressing health at an individual behavior level rather than interacting with relevant social, cultural, and political contexts that create and perpetuate the injustice. And so this is a very big deal to acknowledge, right? If you are going to take on a justice framework in your work and whatever you do, you need to ask the political and economic and social and cultural questions that lead to why do some people have, why are there some exposures and unequal protection? And so if you're joining my lab and working with me, you are prompted to not only do rigorous environmental monitoring and science and analyses, you have to do rigorous social science and acknowledgement at an interweaving these contexts that are creating the injustices in our society. 
I wanted to acknowledge, right, that I have a post, I did a postdoc with an environmental sociologist, Phil Brown, who's known for popular epidemiology, acknowledging what community members do to address contamination. And they wrote a very important book and documented their efforts in Warburg, Massachusetts. But I want to acknowledge other environmental sociologists like Dr. Pello, who's proposed critical environmental justice, right, which is acknowledging that ecological destruction is one of the first forms of social violence. We also should acknowledge environmental, uh, or excuse me, indigenous environmental justice and acknowledge that Native American tribes are governments and have connections to traditional homelands and continue to suffer from what's listed here on this slide. And this is a shout out to a professor at Northern Arizona University, but also acknowledging the indigenous researchers we have here on campus, Chief Jennings, Carol, and so forth. There's also, if you can use a law lens, here's a taxonomy of environmental justice, advocating and calling for that we need distributive, procedural, corrective, and social justice. And so these are places to get more information about environmental justice and people who are building and scaffolding definitions and ways to achieve justice. And we, this is critical because if you can achieve justice, environmental health disparities will be reduced. And these disparities are unnecessary, avoidable, and unjust, right? There, this comes down to an ethical dilemma and something that we can be working towards. So working towards this, we call upon structural change. What does this mean? Structural change means creating the changes at the meso or macro level, looking towards hitting the environmental policy and legislation, truly, truly creating a change that will be sustained. And one thing that we've seen come about is this move is more and more participatory approaches to research or public participation in scientific research. I have a C asterisk here because the terminology is over. There's like 10 to 15, probably even more different terms that have been proposed across different uh, disciplines. So you have anthropologists, environmental science, ecological studies, public health, right? Acknowledging that when you work together with those who are affected by the challenge, you are, you one, you're democratizing, but you're also acknowledging the knowledge, right? Because those who are living closer to the problem have the solution. And so here I'm advocating for that public participation in scientific research. Again, terms like co-created, um, terms like community science, citizen science has, is being critiqued right now. That's a whole nother topic. Um, community owned and managed research, community based participatory research, participatory action research, the list can go on. The idea is that we work together. And we're noticing that not only do these efforts of working together take get us closer to structural change? These efforts are transforming investigations. They're changing the way that data is generated and the way that data is communicated and shared. And so if we were to look at the steps in scientific research, we can see those listed here. There's uh, the 10 generic steps. What I advocate and I'm going to talk about for the rest of the today is that you work towards and you have a work alongside community members and community champions through as many of these steps as possible. And so honing in a little bit more to the communities in which I am um, engaged and work alongside, we live in an area, right? We have a copper star in our uh, state flag. And so we live near a resource. Um, we have a lot of resource extraction within Arizona, but resource extraction exists across the world. And so if you imagine you live here, you can start to get a sense of maybe some of the questions and concerns you might have. And when you think about choosing or defining a question for study, it should be derived from those community members. And so with Garden Roots and Project Harvest, community members are asking questions about the safety of soils. Imagine you are taking on this public health intervention and prevention strategy by growing your own food, reducing your carbon footprint, creating green space, but pollution gets in the way of that effort. Um, imagine that you're, you live in a community that has the second highest incidence rate of breast cancer across uh, as a county, um, the county within a state, and you wanna understand how arsenic and cadmium exposures contributing, um, or if uh, con ingestion of local plants and soil are contributing to your exposures that might be leading to breast cancer. Is my air safe to breathe? Are there pollutants in harvested rainwater? 
And so I showed you some pictures of like of mining and resource extraction, but why don't we look at the toxic release inventory facilities? So this is managed by the EPA. And right now that um, Arizona has around 264 facilities and you can see where those facilities are located and honing in on the communities in which I will uh, talk a little bit about today is acknowledging, right, that Southern Metropolitan Tucson has the higher incidence of those toxic release um, inventory areas in their area. This is, um, and I've been working with Southern Metropolitan Tucson area since 2006 in partnership with the Sonoran Environmental Research Institute. Also building relations in Dewey Humboldt, a community neighboring and sandwiched between a mining, mine tailings pile as well as a former smelter, and then active and or and combined active and legacy mining in Hayden Winkleman in Globe, Miami. I put the year here, right, to acknowledge that these efforts take time to build partnerships. So if we move right along with the steps in scientific research, I'm gonna highlight the ways that community members are we're working alongside community members. So here's an observation and comment from a participant. Right below the mine was our school, Washington. That was when the smelter didn't have any controls. There would be sulfur smoke coming out of the stack. When it rained, you'd get acid rain. We'd, cho we'd be choking because the fumes were so bad, but it was just part of life. We lived there and accepted it. Here's an image of that area. And here we can see that this is a parent and the, um, the significant other, other of a minor who's talking about having up to epileptic children and, and epilepsy is very common around here. So is kidney disease and lupus. I would contribute this to the contaminants in the mind. And so those are the type of stories you hear. And so in this work, I would want to preface that there's a high volume, like you're working to do this effort, but you're also like be hearing all these stories. And I would like to acknowledge that I'm a vessel of these experiences and stories and lived experiences of these families. Here's an example, right? So thinking about like what it's like to understand what the research question is and collecting and um, observations and working through the scientific process. I'm showing here, uh, this is the Iron King Mine and Humboldt Smelter site. You can see this has um, incredibly high levels of arsenic and lead and it readily moves with wind and water. And you can also see on the right side, uh, you see Len, a former mayor and a community champion and mother below Rose. And these individuals are, um, you know, going to the first community meeting in this space in 2008, hearing people ask about whether they could grow foods in their gardens and if so, how much they could eat. And so I'm acknowledging these individuals because I remember going up to them and other community members and saying, this is such a good research question. I don't have specific answer, but would you like to work together on it? And they, um, they said yes, and we are still um, in contact and working in this space. But that engagement might, so that was going and showing up to a community meeting housed by, um, hosted by the Environmental Protection Agency because that site just got listed on the national priorities list for, uh, for cleanup because it was an uncontrolled site. Here you can see that engagement and partnership was fostered by a superintendent of an entire school district. This is where the superintendent was uh, supportive of any research, but very much wanted to ensure that students and teachers were had access to more science education and tools and modules. And so this was fostered through that inf uh, providing informal science education. This is uh, another example of working in Globe Miami area where I worked with Cooperative Extension and a um, director of a uh, cultural center. However, uh, they were like, we're really interested in working with you doing some environmental monitoring. However, you need to get uh, meet with the mine and get their blessing, which I had never have been told before that I would have to go do like the classic dog and pony show, right, to uh, the mine to say like for them to give me permission to work in this environment. However, so I listened to the community champions, right? That's a big deal is like, they're local experts in their own right. Um, quoting uh, Jason Colborn from Street Science. And so, yes, I did the presentation and Freeport McMurrin gave me their blessing and I continued to work in this space. I want to acknowledge, however, that the um, cultural center and it was a former uh, segregated school for Mexican, uh, Mexican American children up until 1952. And so this made a, uh, was very uncomfortable as a Latina scientist coming into this space, being in a building 
that had been segregated from the rest of um, from the Caucasians because Mexicans were only going to be able to do trade and they were not as intelligent as their uh, Anglo counterparts. This was a context to be aware of, a context for me to work through as a researcher, but also a context that I had to address with my students. Here's an example of working with a coalition. Uh, this is where a uh, shout out to Roy C. Chavez, um, who in uh, loving memory, unfortunately they passed away, who reached out and we started working together in 2018 and very much taught me about what it's like to balance social, environmental and economic gain in a town. But here you can see this is Superior, Arizona, where the actual human body, right? You have a Latino, right, is, is turned into a drill right, that their bodies is this technology to extract. Um, and this is in their town hall. And so you can see how mining is ingrained into this space. However, they are co concerned coalition wanting to ensure that future populations aren't exposed to pollutants, but also don't have their resources depleted. Looking at Southern Metropolitan Tucson area. So I'm giving you an example of how these partnerships and relationships begin because this is actually the main question I get. People are like, where do I start? How do I do this? And so here's an example of working with a community-based organization, the Sonoran Environmental Research Institute and hosting a uh, promotora or community health worker training. In this case, this was on climate change adaptation. And we uh, together uh, hosted, well, um, hosted a training in Spanish. Uh, and then these promotoras received their certificate and then went out and trained homeowners. And we have a really great paper documenting the self-efficacy and knowledge that each of these promotoras gained by a, as a result of the project, but also that the promotoras were successful in transferring messages of climate change adaptation and resiliency to families, and that family self-efficacy raised as a product of this experience. Give me a shout out that that's my mom. Uh, was very uncomfortable having your mom in a training session. However, uh, they did amazing. They did amazing. Moving right along, where am I at? It's 1230. How many people do we have here? Okay, we've got about 12 or 11. Uh, specifically within Project Harvest, I want to acknowledge intersectionality, right? These they, um, an intersectionality coming from Dr. Crenshaw, looking at the experiences and things that create vulnerabilities. Right. In this case, if we look at Project Harvest participants, we can see that over 50% were low income, limited income, were my um, a, a people of color with the, about 42% being Latino, Latinx, Latina. We saw that um, over 50% were uh, did not have a college degree and almost 50% were from rural communities. And so this is a critical, this is critical to understand the what we call the social ecology. And the, under, and the intersectionalities, which might create disparities and might create injustices and or perpetuate them. With that grant with Project Harvest, it was funded through um, at NSF, but it was from Advancing Informal Science Learning. And one of the main things that was written for that grant was to tease out how to increase the diversity and inclusion of citizen science projects. And so one of the things that I'm gonna highlight here is that we noticed that for non-traditional participants, right? They're more likely to be motivated to be part and to partner and to do work together. If you're, uh, there's an existing relationship with an individual or organization. And if you're clearly connecting the research to an identified community issue. So this is where it's really, really important to meet people where they are, recognize multiple forms of knowledge, acknowledge that the community members are local experts in their own right and to work together. The other thing is that in traditional citizen science programming, what has been documented is age, um, is that uh, white, low, uh, high income and participants with a four year degree, traditional participants were motivated for the sake of learning or contributing to science. However, in this work, in this project with non-traditional participants, they were not motivated to contribute to science. They were motivated to understand environmental health right, and the perceived risk that they had in their spaces. Another thing, uh, you might spend a lot of time in some of your programming developing written materials. Uh, we spent a lot of time um, making a bilingual, uh, bilingual materials written, and ultimately we found that people were more supported by the personal interactions, so having promotoras, community uh, health workers, and liaisons, and building in open communication and uh, bi-directional pathways between 
uh, um, participants and staff and other community members, um, and also hosting data sharing events via social events to allow for peer-to-peer -peer data interpretation. So really, if you were to do this work, the support was through personal interaction, not the written materials. And this goes down to barriers. So non-traditional participants are less likely to have the reliable computer or internet access. And so there needs to be alternatives to digital materials. And free, um, bear, time was the most frequently reported barrier. And so the way we worked, the way this was acknowledged and incorporated into the study design was to allow for flexibility and have a tiered participation structure so that participants can uh, do the work and do um, their science, their science on a timeline that makes sense for them. Moving right along to data collection and samples, uh, this is just acknowledging that uh, community members are trained, right? So, um, and they decide if they are interested in, uh, if they're worried about uh, a play area for soils, then they would only do like a surface scraping. If they're interested in the soil for plants, they would maybe go down, uh, you know, for the most common vegetables grown in gardens, about six inches down, they'd collect samples. If they were worried about water, if they're worried about the plants themselves, if they're worried about dust. And so really community members lead, decide what the question is, what they want to monitor. And then they have, they work in their own space to sample areas that they are most concerned with and where there might be the most exposure. So if they're going to build a children's playground area, they might want to sample there before they build anything. Here's um, some beautiful pictures of the uh, samples that we get from um, across the United States. I believe this uh, top upper left one is highlighting samples from across the Arizona taken by a student, Kunal Palawat, as well as the plant samples in the middle. If we think about analyzing samples and data, this is where in Project Harvest, we had a do-it-yourself or do-it-together methodology. This is where uh, participants would have the, all the materials needed to get the uh, reading for um, inorganic arsenic in their water or soil sample. They would run that experiment and report the data back to us um, if they wanted to. And then also a sulfur reducing bacteria um, do-it-yourself methodology that would be an ind possible indicator of a total coliform and or equali. So one of the, um, so this was really critical as to have a, this tiered approach and to have a do-it-yourself version so that participants could do it on their own time and get data in a more rapid uh, way. The other thing is that participants are contributing to the exposure assessment. So they are tell, uh, completing dietary assessments and different surveys and just through participant observation informing this exposure assessment calculation. So it's very much about how much they might be exposed to on a daily rate, um, how much they're in the garden, how many, uh, what should be the variables or sorry, uh, values used for these different variables in an exposure assessment calculation that will give us the milligrams of contaminant per kilogram of body weight per day. And these values allow us to then compare to reference uh, doses and cancer slope factors. The other thing is that exposure pathways differ by metal. And so this is just one example from one community. And so it's critical to uh, have uh, do this data interpretation and then work with community members to design the mitigation, but also to inform new work. Other thing is that participants are selecting what plants they want to select, uh, they want to submit for analysis. And we can see that we have over almost a thousand plant samples across all garden roots and project harvest, and that plant uptake patterns are different by contaminant and plant. And so it's very important to be working alongside to truly uh, have a better exposure assessment. And if we move into the last section of looking at an, um, interpreting data translating results into action, discussing results, I wanna highlight that we've done formative uh, process and summative evaluation on our data sharing materials. And so here's an example of how to read the garden roots graph. And so you can see, I'll show um, this is informed by the participants, promotoras, internal and external advisory board members. And you can see that part of, um, we are integrating different standards, advisories, or guidelines that we can find based on participants' use of water, rainwater, and uh, soils. And for uh, this is just an animation. 
you can see here that in both the project, well, this is specific to project harvest. You see that participants can see the rainwater compared to the field blank they collected. They can then compare their data point to others in the study, and then they can compare it to different standards that would be um, that they formed, Is, or meaning that based on how they use their water, we selected those standards and integrated them into the visual. We also uh, one of the things uh, built into the grant was to tease out how art affected the environmental communication process. So this is where it was very exciting. I had a master's of fine arts student, Dorsey Kaufman, uh, work on the project and ripple effect is a major component of their MFA. And what we did is we converted the project harvest data point into a vibration. So you had a speaker that would vibrate with, and on top of the speaker would be a tray of water. And then you'd have a, a light that would go off if it was exceeding a standard. And this work we've published and are gonna be presenting it at a um, creativity and cognition um, meeting in the summer. But what's exciting going back to this is we teased out learning outcomes based on data sharing method. So what happens if you just get the booklet? What happens if you get the booklet and the art experience? And one of the things we can say right now is that we've noticed that they're able to recall their data at more at a more specific level with the art experience, and they have a more emotional response. In all of this work, it's critical, especially with the data sharing, to provide people with solutions and strategies to prevent and reduce exposures right when they get their data. And so this is important because it builds efficacy while so it's increasing awareness and knowledge, but you're building efficacy and informing decision making. So if we think about all this work, right, like what can I and we do? So we have seen that like over time, right, individual people, that the data isn't this experience of co-producing a data set, co-designing a project, that it's informed, people are um, using the information to inform their choices and it's leading to different forms of action. But when we think about collective action that you see here with regards to the polluters or products, that, um, chemicals that are hard to avoid, this requires what we call the outer circle of the environmental health literacy framework, which we call in community change. And so using this environmental health literacy framework, which you see presented here, we've been teasing out learning outcomes and outcomes that based uh, that participants have had throughout the project. We've seen increases in scientific and environmental literacy, as well as numeracy. Interestingly, well, due to the pandemic, we had to cancel our lot, lot last monsoon sampling. So we did before and after monsoons, we had to cancel that in the last year of the project. But what we did is we administered a survey to see if people were more rely, are relying more on their harvested rainwater and their gardens because of the pandemic. And in that process of co-generating that survey with the promotoras, the community health workers, a promotora said, I wonder if because they've been getting the data visualizations every year and they've been work coming to data sharing events and working with us, I wonder if they're able to better interpret pandemic data and the data visualizations being developed to talk about the pandemic and COVID-19 incidence rates. And I was like, that's such a good question. And so we built that into the survey and I'm happy to report that over 60% of participants agreed and strongly agree with the statement that as a result of Project Harvest, they were better able to interpret pandemic data. The other thing is seen highlighted in this quote. Um, you can see here, this is a participant saying, being able to participate in something that's at my home and I get to see what happens there and then get the type of laboratory results that show exactly what's going on is really valuable. And that, if I had any perceptions that is different than what this, this booklet says or is, I have to reconsider and say, these are the facts. When we think about environmental health action and self-efficacy, Participants, right, again, these non-traditional participants started out with high self-efficacy, right, sense of learning and doing science, and that was maintained throughout the first year of the project. We've also seen that participants are successfully interpreting their data and translating that into action. This is a um, kind of a circular bubble graph, right, showing how people were responding to the data data sharing, but what I'd like to show is that they are, you see under results interpretation, you see understanding results, right, uh, surprise, their responses to it, um, and then their intention to uh, change behavior. And so again, this, you know, no need to kind of read all of these, but you can see here that 
participants uh, took an action in the first you see here in the first column based on their data that they were presented. And by all these check, check marks, I'm indicating that it was supported by the evidence presented to them. So they're interpreting this data successfully and translating it into action at the individual and residential level. But what are we doing at this community building and community change level? And this is where I would say that for garden roots, we've been able to see structural change, but in the form of what we call the little p. So Kambi et al. talked about strengthening community capacity in Detroit to influence policy change for health equity. And so using what they called the little p, I would, garden roots has been able to achieve um, outcomes with the little policy. And so one, um, we've, we, through garden roots, we uh, discovered that the water utility was serving water exceeding the drinking water standard for arsenic. Myself and community members worked together to make sure that the state and federal government knew about this. The state went and tested. Yes, in fact, it was exceeding and that uh, water utility was issued a notice of violation and fined and forced to get into compliance. And another Garden Roots community, community participants were uh, or participant documented fugitive dust emissions from a decorative rock company that would make decorative rock for the city of Phoenix. This is where that participant took pictures, time stamped them, whether, you know, had, you know, had a whole, uh, you know, nicely set uh, observations. And they're like, Monica, what do I do about this? Like, we have to address this. And I was like, send it to the state. Let me show you how to form, uh, how to send in a formal complaint to have, make sure it gets addressed. Sure enough, they did that. And at the next community meeting, they were like, Dr. Ramirez told me how to do this. I did it. And actually the state came out and checked on it. And that um, facility, that company was not meeting the was exceed, like not controlling their fugitive dust emissions and got a notice of violation. And so this is what we'd call the little P and we're looking for how the little P will continue in these communities or how we can have more structural change as a result of these programs. But this really prompted, and this is where I'll end. I know it's 1245, so just uh, bear with me for, we did start five minutes, uh, a little five minutes behind or not behind, but. And this is where I'd like to big shout out to Leona Davis, the first author on the paper called Participatory Research for Environmental Justice, a Interpretive Critical Synthesis. This is where we asked, what are study design elements that prompt structural change to benefit environmental justice communities? So I've given you like this whole like introduction to justice, racism, like what this work we have to do. I've talked about participatory approaches, what has been done um, coming out of my lab, and working uh, alongside uh, these communities and within uh, communities here. But like, what it can be done? Like, are we doing the right thing? And so this is where we did um, this synthesis. And what I want to acknowledge that uh, is that design elements that prompt structural change. So after doing, again, reviewing 500 papers, narrowing it down to over 200, and then getting those that actually led to structural change, which was only 26, right? These are the major findings from this work. Right. So this was important to evaluate. So you're you're doing evaluation as you do these programs. But this was a large lit review to then inform the field and to inform future work. And so 100 percent of the studies described structural change outcomes started with local knowledge informing the research question. So check research question informed by local knowledge. You got to do that. We also saw that there was a moderate correlation between structural outcomes and project partners lasting more than four years. So this highlights long-term commitment, and this acknowledges that these partnerships do not adhere to grant cycles. Um, moving right along, right, we saw that you have is community-directed and formal participant structures, right? So really, you know, community-directed, employing community members in this process, and also opening the policy window and, um, and engaging policymakers and decision makers in the research design and process throughout. So in addition to, to working with the communities affected, you're also working with decision makers. And of, nine, of the 19 case studies that successfully achieved policy wins, policy related activities and goals were included in project planning. So this means that you're thinking about that legislation and policy outcome while you're designing and co-designing your projects. I also want to acknowledge right that in the uh, studies that result in structural change, 81% collected data from more than one source and 50% collected both quantitative, right? Like the air quality measurements and qualitative, like the personal stories and did uh, qualitative analyses as well. And then 50% engaged in data translation for decision makers, meaning that they made sure the materials were available for decision makers and written in appropriate formats or 
written and available in different formats for decision makers. Again, acknowledging that right working towards what we call the little p um, in the 19 case studies that had that policy win, you not only saw that policy really activities and goals were included in project planning, but that the policy win was at the more uh, at the local or superintendent or district level um, or town level, right? So the, what Combi at all and what we saw is that you kind of work you work locally, and then over time you can work at the state and federal uh, for state and federal changes. This is just a critique, right? Some people like to say like, oh, just they were part of the project and that's a benefit, right? And so we talk about this um, increased understanding of environmental health and efficacy, which we know is important, but the benefits of just understanding or having self-efficacy may not outweigh the community members limited amount of time and energy, nor provide a clear path to action. So you can't just say like, we did this and now we're done, you have the information to make a change. Right. And so the recommendations for the future based on this large um, all this work, right, is that you're leveraging the power and privilege that you have as an academic institution, as an educated person. You have structural change as a goal and you consider positionality. So what does this mean? Structural change as a goal. You're truly evaluating the root causes of identified environmental health risks. You're analyzing the power and policy structures that create and perpetuate the risk. You're identifying feasible uh, structural change goals and you're evaluating your efforts, right, to make sure that they're benefiting the community. Lastly, we acknowledge positionality and we wrote about this as cultural knowledge brokers so the, that you have individuals within these um, at the decision making uh, table, or in this case, academic spaces that are cultural knowledge brokers with an understanding of the community experience and the science. Um, to enhance the rigor and relevance of participatory research. So I would say that I'm a cultural knowledge broker because I'm from the communities which I'm aiming to serve, as well as having the scientific understanding and expertise. However, there's a, you can see all these promotores here are cultural knowledge brokers as well. So the promotores for Project Harvest are listed at the very top, as well as other team members for Project Harvest. Um, but I end the presentation here with thanking all the community researchers and students in the laboratory. And thank you so much. Thank you so much, Monica. Let me see um, if we have questions. Um, we have a question, um, which is, could you change details of the creativity and cognition conference you mentioned? Sure, yes. sure, I guess. Sure. So this is the first author, Dorsey Kaufman, myself. Uh, we submitted this in, so we submitted in 20, gosh, the pandemic like really messes up time schedules. Anyways, we have a paper that I can put in the chat and then the paper was accepted and published and now we finally get to actually exhibit the work. And this will be in Ven um, in Italy at a very important museum. And so I can put that paper in the chat for you. Right. Um, we have a few, we can probably take questions, a couple more questions. Do we have any additional questions? Um, I, I had one, so I'll jump in. Um, I, I'm wondering if at all your data, the data collected by your citizen scientists were, have been used to make, um, presented to the, say the mining companies to make changes in the remediation practices and policies. So that's a really good question. So right now, so right now we have all we've, I mean, this work of the students has been amazing. So we have drafts of papers that we're super excited about that we're trying to one. So because we, there are participants that want to be co-authors. So not only are we working with the academic partners, we have community partners and some of them speak Spanish. And so we're translating those papers into Spanish for peer for internal peer review to then submit to the journal. And so I think after we have a couple of these publications, mm -hmm. it will be very important to do this broad dissemination. So we have not set up specific meetings with the minds. Um, what we have done is we've done um, elaborate data sharing at the end of every year in multiple formats in multiple languages, and they have a hard copy, they have a password per password to enter a password protected database um, and visualization and mapping system for them to go through. However, we have not done this broad dissemination, which we really hope to we will be doing after we publish the peer reviewed journal articles. 
I will acknowledge that we do we did work closely with City of Tucson. They were on the internal advisory board, and so we did um, have a very specific meeting just for their team to go over all of this data due to their rebate program and to talk mm. about what should be. Um, how to inform their decision making and they're really kind of waiting on us to make this like executive summary that they can just kind of tack into everything they do and which we're excited about making but we just need to get these peer-reviewed journal articles out so so when you say city of tucson you mean um city uh, tucson uh, water tucson water yeah my water, for their water harvesting rebate program okay. yeah yeah um any other questions from participants I know your work has very direct implications for urban planning. Um, we have, uh, you know, urban planning program here and um, the work that you do is very instrumental to the kind of work that planners do on the ground in community planning. It looks like we don't have any other questions. And Monica shared her article for those who would like to click on that link um, to see the yeah, so that's the ripple effect article. And then the if there is interest in the um, participatory. No. I was just going to, I'll put this one in the chat if there. Okay. We're getting so good at the Zoom thing, huh? <laughs> um, okay. If there aren't any more questions, I'm going to thank um, Monica for coming to our college and participating and, and providing us with a really interesting lecture. I um, found it quite fascinating the work that you're doing. I'm familiar with the Dewey Humboldt line. Um, I'm sure you are. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I hear about it whether I want to or not. I know. <laughs> um, okay. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate you coming. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day and weekend. Thanks, you too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.